We have with us a very special guest, CJ Holmes. CJ, welcome to the podcast today. Thanks for having me, y'all. Um, and so a little background on CJ. CJ is a writer for The Athletic. He is the beat reporter for Villanova. Um, and he has done a great job in the last year plus, despite kind of just working through the pandemic. Um, obviously, I loved his text throughout all last year, checking into work, which is just basically like looking at his television. Uh, but he was super pumped when he got to go to a couple of Villanova, uh, Villanova games at the Finn. Um, so CJ, it's great to have you. And I'm sure you're looking forward to actually covering Villanova in person this year. Yeah, I really am. Uh, last year was definitely an experience, you know, having to move cross country in the middle of a pandemic. You know, you know, I'm not just a Villanova beat writer. Now I'm a big five beat writer. And yeah. having headway into you know five different programs with no in-person access was uh definitely a tough task but uh, I hung in there I feel like I learned a lot not only about you know Villanova basketball but you know Philadelphia college basketball as a whole and you know I'm just hoping that this year we can get back to some uh resemblance of normalcy and you know I can do the job the way it's meant to be done well, what's crazy about the big five thing is that is that there are five schools in the same general vicinity that couldn't be more different yeah, I mean, I, I agree. You know, uh, I, I didn't get I, I haven't been able to get out to a Sal game yet. I believe that's the only big five school where I did not attend a home game last year. Not but, you know, but, you know, going from, you know, up on the main line at Villanova to, you know, down at Temple to oh, and Penn. I haven't been to a game at Penn yet. I haven't been in the Palestra. I haven't stepped foot in that building. Yet. So I'm excited about that. Oh, that's a good one. But just from the schools I did get the 10 home games last year, you know, Villanova, Temple, and St. Joe's, they're all very different. You know, when you're hanging around campus, they're all like different vibes, you know, and they're all special and unique in their own way. Cool. Um, so, CJ, tell me, how'd you get here? Tell me a little bit more about kind of what – I know you played college basketball at Auburn, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but tell me kind of how you came from – you know, from where, where you came from to being a, being a sports reporter. Oh man. I don't know if you got enough time on the pod to get through all that. <laughs> it has the cliff notes. A version. bridge version. Yeah, bridge we'll, version. We'll, we'll, we'll cut you off. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, you know, long story short. I... All right. That, that's good. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my journey in journalism really started at IMG Academy. Um, I remember I was sitting in my coach's office, Coach Vince Walden, and I was uh, filling out my, you know, application for Auburn when I first found out that I was going to be given the opportunity to be a walk-on there. And, you know, walk-on players, unlike regular players, you know, still have to go on the website, you know, fill out your application. And, you know, that little <laughs> bubble comes up, you know, that little prompt comes up, what do you want to major in? And I kind of just stared at it for a second. I, I didn't I didn't really know. Um, you know, at that point, I still had unrealistic hoop dreams. I figured I'd be the, the walk on to defy the odds and get to the NBA shortly after my first college practice. I realized that would not be the case. <laughs> but uh, backtracking a little bit, I really didn't know. So I remember I was in one of those little swivel chairs. I spun around and looked at my looked at Coach Vince and I was like, Coach, you know, I don't really know what I want to be when I grow up in a sense right and he was kind of like you know what do you like and you know I was like I like reading I like writing and I like sports and he kind of just stopped me there and you know filling out the application wasn't like a, I wasn't on a time press to get that done so what he said was you know go back to your dorm come back and talk to me tomorrow so I come, so after practice the next day, I go, I go, I go into coach Vince's office and he has a book for me just sitting there laying on the table called don't put me in coach by Mark Titus. Yes. Great <laughs> book. It. Great um, book. I spent the rest of the week reading that book cover to cover. I, I can honestly say I've never read a book that quickly in my life. And I was inspired. 
You know, I wanted to, you know, Mark was a guy who, you know, made the best of his situation. You know, mm-hmm. he went from an unheralded walk on to, you know, at least in our walk on world, you know, our leader. <laughs> yeah. You know, and just the way he was able to take his college experiences and you know, tell a story and, you know, make interesting characters out of his teammates. Like Evan Turner was the villain, the villain, yeah. right? Yep. I just thought that was so cool. And then, you know, once I read that book, I started, you know, looking at stuff on Grantland and I followed him later, you know, as he went to the, you know, as Grantland turned into the ringer and, you know, I told myself, that's what, I, that's what I wanted to do. I, I want to try this whole journalism thing. Um, so when I first got to Auburn, my freshman year, uh, we weren't able to take any of our major classes. Right. So we had to take all of our core, you know, core curriculum, you know, run of the mill classes. Uh, you weren't at Auburn. You can't, at least in the journalism course, you can't take your, you know, your journalism classes until your sophomore year. Hmm. So sophomore year rolls around. Um, I was taking journalism 1100, which basically consists of like a hundred question spelling tests. You get four of them, you know, in the class and you basically have to get at least a B on each of them to pass the class. Sorry, an 1100 question spelling test? Sounds ridiculous. The words were hard, man. <laughs> I believe it. It's just like, it's crazy. The words were hard, man. It was like a hundred questions. Long story short, I failed my first time around. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, this girl I was dating at the time, uh, luckily she was a journalism major, you know, she studied me up. Oh, well, she helped me study and got me together. And I was able to pass the class second time around. Next thing I knew I was writing for the school paper. And that was a fun experience. Cause you know, I, I don't know, maybe CJ McCollum did something at Lehigh, but like, I can't recall many student athletes who are active student athletes who also write for the school paper. Totally. So I remember sometimes I'd like get done with practice, go to the locker room, you know, change into something presentable, then walk out to the floor to cover a girls game, you know, things like that. Yeah. So that was a cool experience. And, you know, of course I'm biased, but I would say the Auburn university Plainsman's is the best student newspaper in the country. There you go. No, no yeah. bias whatsoever. None. It's fine. But do, I got, you, do you sleep? Did you sleep at all in college? Uh, not really. No. Yeah, I was going to say, being a Division One athlete and getting involved in anything beyond just being a Division One athlete and going to school seems impossible. It was tough, man. Um, I remember countless nights. Sophomore year, I moved off campus uh, with my teammate and best friend, KT Harrell. And I remember nights where they'd be partying out, you know, out in the main area. And I'm back in my room with the doors locked with earplugs trying to, you know, type a soccer story. Oh, my god! <laughs> type up a soccer feature or something. So it definitely took some sacrifice, you know, between that and basketball. Certainly didn't get a lot of sleep. Didn't get a lot of sleep after a lot of those lopsided losses, too. But uh, it, it was a good experience, man, and it built me up. And, you know, I was able to take my experience at the Plainsman, and that led to internships. And, you know, internships eventually, after a year living at home post-graduation, led to my first job at the, the Dallas Morning News. Stayed there for a year working as a digital producer. Um, then I was hired by The Athletic to cover the Arizona Cardinals. Right. Moved out to Phoenix, Arizona. About two months on the job, the Cardinals were so bad. The Athletic was like, "We have this guy has to do something because I was second <laughs> on the beat behind Scott Bordeaux. So, you know, with a bad team, there wasn't really that many intriguing storylines to go around, right? I remember one time uh, I left locker room availability and I was so excited, you know, to tell my editor, uh, Jay Diefenbach, that I was like, hey, man, I got this great uh, feature on Christian Kirk. Like, it's going to be great. Yeah, Scott's already doing that. <laughs> Nice. And I was just, oh man, yeah, that's... But... You're like I found the one interesting story about yeah. this team. He's like, yeah, Scott's already doing that. But uh, luckily, the athletic was still able to, uh, you know, find something for me to do. So from there, they made me more of a journal assignment writer. I floated around from Cardinals, the Suns, um, did some Arizona wow. State stuff. Went down to Tucson a couple times. You know, that's funny because every time I went down to Tucson to cover something Wildcats related. I drove to the city and I was like, I would not want to live here under any circumstance. <laughs> but sure enough, after a year of me doing the GA stuff, uh, the company decided to give me my own beat down in Tucson. And I went down there, covered basketball and football. 
um, made some good connections, you know, and, and, it, and it was great, right? Because growing up on the East Coast, I used to, I was the kid that stayed up until 11, 10, 11 o'clock at night for Pac-12 after dark, you know, oh, watching yeah. Sean Miller's Wildcats. I, I wish I was wow, good enough yeah. to recruit me. So to be able to, you know, have those experiences in the McHale Center and to be able to, you know, cover a great freshman class like Nico Manny and Josh Green and Zeke Naji. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a lot of fun. Can't say so much on the football side. That was a train wreck. Oof, yeah. But on the yeah. basketball side, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, the only thing – I wouldn't say it's a regret because it never happened, but the only thing I look back, I'm like, dang, I wish that happened, was that the Pac-12 tournament uh, got canceled because of COVID. You know, Arizona was set for – you know, at least, you know, us media folks thought that Arizona was primed to, you know, get on a run, you know, maybe, you know, win the Pac-12 tournament out in Vegas and – I remember after they beat Washington, it was like their most, it was, it was their most convincing win of the year, their most well-rounded team win of the year. And I remember writing my game story excited. I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I hear some chatter behind me that, you know, Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID-19. And, you know, I think we all know what happened after yeah. that. You know, Pac-12, I was on, I was on, I packed for a week. I packed for a week. That's how much faith I had in the Wildcats. I was only out in Vegas. I was in Vegas for less than 24 hours. Oh God! Oh man, it's so depressing. I mean, it's, it's the I right amount of time week. to be in Vegas, though. Like twenty-four hours, yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, seventy-two hours is the right amount of time to be in Vegas. So then you got to get the hell out of there. Down, down. So down. from there, I uh, let's see. Went back to Tucson. You know, all the all the COVID stuff started coming down, and you know, social unrest, and you know, my whole summer was basically just trying a way to stay productive with you know basically no access the world was on fire and no idea when it would get back to normal but kept grinding out kept trying to find you know unique interesting stories to tell and unfortunately um a lot of my teammates at the athletic athletic arizona ended up getting laid off uh, because of the pandemic but you know i would like to think that you know because of the work i put in or something, <laughs> my job was spared. And, you know, I remember the athletic asked me, you know, so what do you want to do now that the athletic Arizona is no longer a thing? And I was like, Hey, uh, I'd, I'd love to cover their NBA. So, and then a day or two later, they're like, all right, well, that's cool and all, but you're going to go cover the big five. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically the same time. Uh, so, you know, I was like, and I was like, which schools are in the big five? And they were like, you know, Villanova, LaSalle, Penn, St. Joe's and Temple. I didn't even know Villanova was in the Philadelphia area. Wow. <laughs> it's like Auburn. Wow. Right? It's like Auburn. I blame that like, on Villanova. I don't blame that on you. That's true. I don't blame you for that. Like a lot of people, it's like the same kind of like phenomenon with Auburn. A lot of people are like, where's Auburn University? They're like, they have That's no idea. True. Like That's somewhere really in Atlanta, I'm like, no, Auburn's in Alabama. I, I had no idea Villanova was uh, in, in the Philadelphia area, even though, you know, from what I've, you know, from what I know now, it's not in Philadelphia. It's just outside of Philadelphia on the main line. <laughs> but from there, Very true. Yeah, I uh, packed my bags up, made the long three day trek across the country got here and got the work and you know despite you know the circumstances not being ideal I think it was a strong year um I think I made you know good progress with the five programs here got to know a lot of people I've talked to as many players as I can alumni you know I, I've gotten the opportunity to talk to some all-time Philadelphia basketball greats and this year I'm looking forward to you know continue to take steps in the right direction and you know, provide the kind of coverage, you know, to this area, you know, that it needs. Awesome. Well, we had a, we had another writer, a fellow writer of yours on the podcast last year, um, Dana O'Neill. And obviously Dana knows this area, like the back of her hand, she eats, sleeps and breathes big five basketball, Villanova basketball, et cetera, has done her whole life. Did she provide tutelage, coaching support to you as you went on this endeavor? Absolutely. Um, as soon as I got on the beat, you know, Dana, Dana didn't know me that well, you know, right. um, we worked together on one story um, over the summer before I got on the big five beat, you know, during um, a lot of the social unrest, we worked on a, a story about college basketball coaches having to amplify their voices. 
um, to, you know, push towards social change. And, you know, that was really the only time we worked together. But as soon as I got on the beat, you know, Dana reached out to me, you know, she wished me the best of luck. She's like, you know, I have some contacts if you need them. And, you know, I'm here if you have any questions. And throughout the year, that's been just what it was. You know, if I'm unsure about something, I, I go to Dana. Um, you know, if, if I have a paragraph that I'm not too sure about, or if I don't know how it's going to sit with the, you know, Philadelphia fan base, I go to Dana and she's always been helpful. And, you know, I'm thankful for that. Uh, this summer, uh, the athletics sent some staff down to the Under Armour event, AAU event, um, down Atlanta, Georgia. And, you know, that was the first time I really got to spend time with Dana O'Neill. And she's fantastic. She's kind. I mean, just looking at her, the way she interacted with, you know, coaches. I mean, they're walking up there to sit with her. They're walking yeah, up true. there to talk she, to her. She's a I presence. Mean, I mean, she's a presence. She's one of the best in the business. And, you know, I'm thankful that, you know, as I continue to, you know, embark on, you know, this beat, this journey, that I have someone like her in my corner. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's super cool. And, you know, you get the impression from Dana that she's tough but fair. And like, and like has a lot of everybody's respect. Um, and it's cool that you had the opportunity to work with her. But I also will say you developed a lot of your talent yourself. And it's really cool to see you in one year develop kind of the inroads that you have. Um, and we'll get into this because the, the articles that you've written in the last few weeks even um, about Villanova have shown just such like a depth and like a, like a depth of knowledge and like a, and like you've gotten into the you get into the weeds with the people and understand how Villanova fans um, and Philadelphia people in general just really want to know full like all around like their athletes and the people that they look up to and root for and cheer for and you you've shown that like really clearly um, so complimenting you on the on the on the few articles that you've written on Villanova to start the season thank you um, um, and we're definitely going to talk quite a bit about that. One quick question before we trans trans transition over to that. I really want to just know, like, you spent time in the Auburn program, and you spent time now, obviously, covering Villanova and the Big Five in general, but just Villanova podcast. So, you know, the rest of the Big Five can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, but tell me a little bit, like, what was different, or what have you seen that's different, whatever it may be, same about the two programs? So much. Uh, so really? much uh not even sure where to start you know I was at Auburn kind of I straddled the the two sides of two different regimes I played my first two years with coach Tony Barbie and I played my last year with uh, Bruce Pearl I didn't play my senior year because I wanted to focus on journalism right but um at least you know that's why I tell people but um you know, and I, I don't want to say this in a way that, you know, undercuts Coach Barbie. I love Coach Barbie. Um, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have had an opportunity to play college basketball in the first place. I'm indebted to him. You know, when I, you know, Coach Barbie's a real stone cold character. You know, uh, I remember we were playing up at Rupp Arena my junior year and I hit a three and you know, Coach Barbie didn't talk to anyone else coming down the you know line to shake hands, but you know he grabbed me, pulled me to him, gave me a hug, and said he was proud of me. And you know that will that will forever mean the world to me. You know, but my first two years of Auburn at Auburn, you know, from an on court standpoint, I mean they were they were rough. Um, at times, I felt like the team didn't have a lot of buy in. Um, you know, we had guys, you know, who had their own agendas. We had guys who weren't taking care of business off the court. Um, even though I was a walk on, you know, I can say that, you know, even I could have done more to <laughs> contribute to the success of our program. Um, and, you know, when you have things like that in a program, when those things aren't in line, it shows on the court. Because here's the thing, y'all. Every college basketball team in the country, especially at the Division One level, has talent. All of these guys were dominant in high school. You know, a handful of these guys were highly rated recruits. But the difference between the teams that have success and the teams that experience failure 
it's the little things it's it's putting in putting up extra shots when no one's watching it's taking care of your business in the classroom it's you know, care, carrying yourself of pride on and off the court. And I'm not saying we didn't have guys in the program at the time I was in there that weren't doing that, but it just wasn't enough. And, you know, all you guys have to do is go to ESPN.com and look up those box scores and that will tell you everything you need to know, really. Um, you know, when, when Bruce Pearl was hired ahead of my junior year, the, the, the vibes in the program immediately changed. Um, you know, we were doing things in different ways. We were, you know, guys were, were, were maybe working a little harder. Um, you know, film room sessions were different. You know, we ate at different times. Um, some of the privileges we had under Coach Barbie were taken away, you know, because Coach Pearl's the kind of coach where, you know, things need to be earned, right? Mm-hmm. And even with that, in Coach Pearl's first year, we still struggled because you can't change a culture overnight. A culture is developed over the course of years. It takes buy-in. It takes a number of different factors to be aligned for a program to have success. And And even sometimes, I would say probably just winning. You need to prove that it works, right? Like sometimes you need to pull off a couple wins. And, you know, although I haven't spent too much intimate time with the Villanova program, from everything I've seen so far and everything I've heard, that's what it is. That's what they've built. That's what Jay Wright's built on the main line. Guys come there and they know they're going to be held to a certain standard. Um, Guys are unselfish. Guys know they're going to play a certain way, no matter who's brought in the latest recruiting class, you know? Um, guys just think and act a certain way. And, you know, that's why Jay Wright's been able to have so much success at Villanova because he runs a tight ship and there's no room for deviation. Um, When I look at a program like Villanova, you know, I, you know, I'm a beat writer, right. Gotta be, gotta be, uh, gotta be fair and unbiased. But I mean, I think it's undeniable that it's, 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 it's a, it's an example of everything that's right in college basketball. You know, I, over the last, you know, couple of days alone, I've talked to, you know, a couple of recruits and, you know, and I've talked to recruits over the past year and they all say the same thing. So, you know, when Villanova goes out there and they have that success, you know, I'm not surprised in the slightest, you know, the difference between the bottom dwellers and the elite is, consistency in character it's consistency in work ethic it's consistency in focus and you know I would say that that's probably the biggest differences I see between Villanova and you know my Auburn programs now Auburn isn't like that anymore you know coach Pearl has been there you know for a while now he's been able to just like just like Jay Wright right you know, in Jay Wright's first couple of years, he struggled, right? It takes a while to instill that vision to get guys, to get your players in the community to believe in it. You know, Coach Pearl came in and, you know, maybe my group, you know, we didn't buy in as much as we should have. But, you know, as the, the recruiting cycles went on and he started to bring in his own guys and they started to get that consistency and that continuity, I mean, look up and we're in the Final Four. And it, these things just take time. You know, so I, I feel like any program can be a Villanova. It's DJ. easier said it's easier said than done, but there is a blueprint. There is a blueprint, and it starts with doing things the right way, treating people the right way, and you know, working your ass off. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you have to go through J Wright media training when you start covering the team? Because I feel like <laughs> to Chris's point earlier about you getting Villanova, I feel like I just heard I heard like Jay in a, in my on my Zoom call right now. That was, <laughs> look, that was look, look, man, if I had a dollar for every time a Villanova player said, "Yeah, man, we're just gonna go out there and play Villanova basketball for a full forty minutes," yeah. I'd be a very <laughs> rich man. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Hence the name of the podcast. No, no <laughs> training here from Villanova. Uh, I'm just speaking facts. I'm just speaking facts. You know, if it wasn't true, trust me, I'd be the first one to refute it. But 
the evidence is undeniable. I've talked right. to so many people in and around the program over the past year. It's all consistent. I've talked to people outside of the program and it's all consistent. That's, that's awesome. It's, it's, I will say it's pretty, you know, it's funny. Like Chris and I obviously spend so much time, like we went to Nova, you know, you hear the talk track for so long. You're like, yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. It's actually pretty cool to hear somebody who's relatively new following the program be like, yeah, this is actually pretty legit. Like it seems to be on the up and up, which is, I, I like that. I didn't expect that. That's cool.